meeting will be Wait for just a couple of minutes. Uh, please bear with us, and uh, in case Nupur doesn't join, then I'll <coughs> begin this session. <coughs> पार्टिसिपेंट्स आ रहे हैं नूपुर को कॉल करके पूछ लो अभी मैसेज आया है कि वो शी इज फाइंडिंग प्रॉब्लम टू ज्वाइन अभी आ रही है वो एक्चुअली उनके ज्वाइन करने में थोड़ी दिक्कत आ रही है तो वो अभी ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं ओके Okay, I think let let me begin. Uh, I welcome. Sir, you can start the session because Nupur ma'am is not able to join, so we can proceed the session, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, good morning to everyone. I I am Dr. Arun Gupta. I am the coordinator of uh, Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India. I am very happy to welcome you all to this. occasion of world breastfeeding week 2021 which begins today is the 20th year and uh, this time the the year is uh, special for all the breastfeeding supporters and advocates it gives us an opportunity to flag issues of concern and which are related to breastfeeding protection the pni was founded in 1991 we are Sure, we all know. And ninety-two, India enacted a enacted a law to protect breastfeeding. Nineteen ninety-five, government of India notified BPNI in the official gazette of India to monitor the compliance with the IMS Act and report it to the courts or authorities. Promotion of breastfeeding through communication and counselling is an important work, no doubt. however the most critical pillar as we we believe is protection from the aggressive promotion or marketing of baby foods whatever we do by way of promotion if we do not check this protection then all our efforts are uh, you know thrown down while women play the crucial role to breastfeed their babies the responsibility of protection lies mostly with the government which i will explain to you later why i am saying so why we should call it shared responsibility but no for your keep him keep a mute i am i'm beginning uh, yeah please mute yourself yeah uh, promotion of uh, uh, i was talking about why did we uh, 
did do the adaptation to where lies their responsibility. The global uh, subtitle is uh, shared responsibility. Of course, breastfeeding is a shared responsibility. Women cannot do it alone. But when it comes to protection from aggressive marketing, I think the couple of areas which are very important where the regulation, where the whole issue of protection lies, either with the government departments or mechanisms or within the health systems. That's why we are focusing our attention to these two this time. So we BPNI also believes that breastfeeding women have the right to be protected from the commercial influence. That's why this, this webinar becomes very, very important. With this background, when we organize this uh, uh, webinar, it, it's, it's my privilege to share with you. Uh, uh, can you share the program, uh, Yashika? That, uh, yes. that the program of the day will run like this. We will have uh, uh, eminent chairpersons, uh, Dr. Shanta Kumari from, uh, she is the president of Foxy and uh, Professor Piyush Gupta, who is the president of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. They will be chairs. I will be moderating this session. And uh, we have a plan that uh, we, the first session will be the basic provisions by Dr. Dinesh Kosla. Then why, what the state governments can do is the role uh, uh, in implementation and monitoring is Dr. Gayatri from UNICEF. Then we have the role and duty of the health professionals, uh, Professor Kumuda from uh, Tamil Nadu. Then why should we monitor? Uh, is Dr. Sunita Katyanan from Jharkhand. And then what are the current practices of baby food companies, how they interfere with the policy is Dr. Vandana Prasad from PHRN. In the end, we will have a few words, closing remarks and the way forward. So uh, let me first invite uh, uh, Dr. Shanta Kumari, who is the president of Foxy for 21-22 for her opening remarks. She is a senior consultant gynecologist and obstetrician specialist in laparoscopic surgery. And she was uh, awarded the fellowship of Royal College of Physicians of Ireland in 2017 and fellowship of Royal College of OB Gyne, RCOG of the London. And she has always been forefront on the activities of this association nationally as well as globally. She is a wonderful experienced obstetrician coming from an academic excellence. And we, uh, we will love to hear your opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Shanta Kumari. Thank you, Dr. Arun Gupta. Uh, good morning, dear friends, colleagues, and all the other uh, dignitaries who have actually joined for this very important uh, webinar, or should I say a dialogue today. Yes, first to seventh, the World Breastfeeding Week, Every year we have seen that uh, always the organizations are trying to promote uh, breastfeeding and trying to see what best we can do that every baby has the right to breastfeed and every mother feels that it's a responsibility to feed the baby. But this year I have seen that there's renewed uh, uh, interest by most partners. I have, uh, to my surprise, actually, I find a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals which are actually uh, only doing other uh, drug promotions they are going out of the way, and uh, this, these are not. I'm trying to promote breastfeeding as a CSR activity, and I think that is a very, very uh, good uh, way or uh, aspect. I can say where all the partners who feel it's their responsibility to actually promote breastfeeding. Friends, this year the Foxy theme has been Foxy for all, always, and Dhira stop violence against women. We believe that Foxy is for every mother to reduce them maternal morbidity and mortality so that we reach the SDG goal. And Foxy is for every mother to promote breastfeeding and all other activities. And of course, Foxy for every woman to have the courage to say no to violence uh, against them. And that is again going towards better health of women. And Foxy for all Foxians to see that we practice with protocols and dignity and we when we take care of our women's health. 
and uh, you all are actually pioneers in this uh, movement of trying to protect the breastfeeding among mothers friends you all i always find it very strange that we have to advocate and protect breastfeeding human beings are the only i think uh, living organs organisms on this uh, face of earth that who are trying to look at some other means of uh, feeding the baby and that should not be the case every baby has the right to the breast milk and that is the best thing a mother can offer to her baby and definitely this year protect breastfeeding because we find that unfortunately the number of uh, immediate uh, starting of the breastfeeding is reducing and the of course whatever be it whether it is the lifestyle or whether it is the career opportunities and all people are some people are trying to wean away from it quickly so we we think it's our responsibility to reiterate that we have to support all mothers during this very important phase in their life you know the, to be a mother is a very emotional aspect and to be able to breastfeed your baby is another emotional aspect the whole family all of us obstetrician gynecologists pediatricians healthcare workers and society at large i think we have to give them and society conducive a opportunities where every mother can feed the baby and that is the only way i see forward and this year especially we have seen last year the covid pandemic and everyone is focusing on the immunity nutrition and so many aspects i think the right time for us also to take the opportunity to tell everyone that yes this is the best food which you can give to your baby because it has lot of antibodies it will increase the immunity of the baby even when they grow up so thank you very much for having me here i'm sure uh, my other uh, colleagues lot of pediatricians are there dr piyush and dr dinesh and others are going to definitely put in their opinion views on how it is our responsibility to see that we can take care of our mothers and babies thank you sir thanks a lot dr shantanu very it's wonderful to hear from you meet you uh, even as a, that, that's so and uh, you for it you can take over now or yes, sir. can you hear me i can hear you but i so noisy at your end that something is wrong terribly wrong so maybe she has to put off the video then the thing will become more uh... okay just a second yeah. I think it's it will be better now. Yeah. Okay, uh, Yashika, uh, there are a couple of people who are calling me uh, for a link, so you can maybe follow up with Dr. Faridi and Dr. Kesu for their links. Okay. Oh, so now, yeah. So now I would like uh, to um, introduce uh, Dr. Piyush Gupta, uh, who is uh, one of our chairpersons today, and thank you, uh, Shanta, ma'am. for your encouraging words and um, uh, let me introduce dr piyush gupta who is an um, md and is the president of the indian academy of pediatrics and the former chairperson pediatric and adolescent uh, nutrition society iib uh, he has published uh, more than 300 papers and has edited and authored 30 books uh, and uh, 30 books and he has been the editor in chief of indian pediatrics from uh, 2008 to 2013 and has been a member of the world association of uh, uh, medical editors uh, awarded by the royal college of pediatrics uk and american academy of pediatrics iap nnf and national academy of uh, medical sciences india and he has always also been awarded the national teacher of excellence award in medical education by vice president uh, india and one of his major uh, you know few of his major initiatives are workshops on and on thesis and scientific paper writing and uh, his first areas are nutrition child survival and medical education over to you sir a very good morning to all my dear friends thank you nupur for that uh, those kind words and a very good morning uh, uh, dr arun uh, gupta sir and uh, with greetings to my co chairperson madam dr shantak mari from uh, foxy and i see the dignitaries here on the on the screen uh, dr vandana dr kumta madam dr gayatri 
Dr. Dinesh Khosla, and all the dignitaries who are also off the screen. So we used to say on the dais and off the dais, so it is on the screen and off the screen. I welcome and I uh, greet everybody. Uh, I think this is a great initiative. Dr. Shanta has already elaborated upon the importance of breastfeeding. We know that and there is no need to go into that detail again. Um, uh, I think the topic that where lies the responsibility? The responsibility lies uh, with everybody. The responsibility lies with the individuals, with the family, with the society, and with the national policy makers. And I think everybody is doing his or her bit, but still, uh, the results are far from optimal. Because we have seen, the, according to the recent data also, in the CNNS survey also, we see that we are not improving on our uh, statistics on breastfeeding. I think uh, we need to introspect ourselves uh, where are we lacking? Maybe we are giving, uh, I, I totally agree that we need to give emphasis on protecting the breastfeeding. That means we need to counter the industry. That, that is perfectly fine and I'm all for it because in the last, uh, in this year when I became the IIP president, we have not taken a single penny of uh, any sponsorship from even the sister concern or so-called the, uh, the faces of the food industry. So we, we need to put our bit in that regards, but at the same time, we need to uh, definitely have programs, especially for the advocacy, for counseling and for health education, going to individual mother. And I think that that part, that uh, 10 steps and a baby friendly hospital initiative uh, somehow, and now in the form of MA, the MA initiative that need to be promoted and populated. I remember uh, we we used to have Dr. Faridi, is, I think he's not joined, but Dr. Faridi used to be at uh, University College of Medical Sciences. And we still remember his passion and how because of him in the UCMS GTV hospital, now there is nil uh, and not only in UCMS, but in the all the neighboring hospitals, wherever he has given his expertise. Uh, so there is uh, no, the rate of breastfeeding are really very good. I think such kind of passion is needed and such kind of leadership is needed uh, to across the country to take it over. So I wish again once all the best and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, on this platform and uh, I wish all the best for the success of this program. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Piyush, for your encouraging words. Uh, now, uh, I would uh, like to introduce uh, Dr. Dinesh Khosla, uh, who's going to uh, have a presentation on uh, the IMSR to the basic provision and its reporting mechanisms. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Dinesh Khosla. Uh, he is a pediatrician, uh, a senior pediatrician with 40 years of experience uh, from Rotak. He's one of the founder members of BPNI and he's a member and uh, of uh, the, uh, he was uh, one of the key members uh, for drafting the IMS Act uh, uh, during uh, its uh, inception while it was getting none. And he got the pharmacy and chemist shops uh, included in the ambit of IMS Act, uh, Amendment Act in 2003. And he was instrumental in getting the six months maternity leave in Haryana, Punjab, Haryana, where the first, uh, it was one of the first states to implement it. And he has been the facilitator for all Haryana government four in one IYC training courses uh, conducted by BPNI. And he has worked with BPNI office team in all BPNI activities since 1990. To and um, uh, now over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Can I have my first slide, please? Yashika, if you can sh uh, share sir's I'm presentation. Sharing, please. I'm sharing. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes. Yes, yes. it is there. So, uh, good morning, everybody. This law was enacted in 1992 after great difficulty. One uh, committed member of parliament put it in as an individual bill in parliament. And then all the members of uh, BPNI motivated their own area of parliamentarians to pass this law. 
and then this law was passed. So on 1 1st August 1993, this central government law was enacted and published as a gazette. And then it was strengthened by an amendment. You know, there's an interesting story about this amendment. There was two days conference, two days workshop to decide about amendments to be done in, in the IMS Act. And on the second day of amendment, we got a SOS from south somewhere that in a small corner of Indian Express, there was a notification by the parliament that they were going to repeal the law. So then all the members hurried up and we sent individual um, letters to the parliamentary office. And that's how we could prevent the repealment of the sect. And then the amendments in 2003 came into existence and the law is there, the amended law is there. Next slide, please. I think we are the, one of the first countries in the world to have a good stringent law uh, in our country. We got it passed. Many countries, they are having a code and many countries are having different forms of uh, this law. The next slide, please. Just give me a second, sir. I'm doing that. Sir, it is not moving. Just give me a second, please. You may switch it off once, uh, Yashika. Otherwise, it won't. Otherwise, use the lower uh, left corner uh, where you have this uh, forward uh, arrow. No. No, sir. No. Just give me a second. I will try once again. Then use no, the sir, lower, no. use the lower left corner where BPNI logo is there. There is a small arrow there for forwarding, rather than uh, using your computer forward. Maybe that will help. Yeah. So before coming to the statements of objects and reasons, I must add that there are two small additional laws which were uh, also adjunct to this IMS Act, and that is what is Cable uh, TV and Cable um, Act, which was passed by Madam Sushma Swaraj, which prevents the cable TV network to promote uh, breastfeeding. It is similar. Although these laws are not much known, but there is another law and the local SP can take cognizance of offense under this cable uh, and TV uh, um, advertisements of the um, baby food companies. So statements of objects and reasons. We must say, we must understand in the first go that uh, although there are clauses uh, which are uh, violations of the law, but whenever there is a dispute, then the main objects and reasons of the law, that is the preamble to the law, also comes into force and many things are explainable. So promotion of infant milk substitute and related products like feeding bottle and teats do constitute a health hazard. Two things I want to clear here. When it writes teats, so somewhere there is a confusion about the nipple shields. They say if the nipple shields come into the ambit of this law or not. Yes, they do come because there may not be a specific law, clause to say it's you know, prohibited, but once it is written in the objects and reasons of the law, then breast uh, nipple shields also are teats which uh, discontinue breastfeeding. And then we, in the court of law, if the judge wants to ask, we say there's a health hazard. So health hazard has a wide um, meaning in this law. It is hazard to the mother, hazard to the infant, hazard to the environment, the carbon footprint, the economic hazard, 
the uh, GDP impact of breastfeeding. So there's a wide variety of hazards which are uh, connected to this small word, which is written as a health hazard. Then promotion of infant milk substitutes and related products has been more pervasive and extensive. That's why if this law had to be passed or the code in the universal code has to be passed because the baby food industry has got lots of money and they use their money power to override whatsoever information we can disseminate as individual doctors. If it becomes a movement, then of course, so this is the Bear Act. Yeah, next slide, please. This is Rules and Regulation, the Bear Act. So this, this is the publication. Next, please. So there are key definitions as to what will be called an infant substitutes. It is any food being marketed or otherwise represented it as a partial or total replacement of for mother's milk or infant up to age of two years. Now this should be taken care that after two years, this law is not implementable. Unless until we find it. So up to two years. Infant foods, any food by whatever name called presented as a complement to mother's milk to meet the growing nutritional needs of the infant after the age of six months and up to the age of two years. Feeding bottles, bottle or receptacle used for the purpose of feeding infant milk substitutes and includes a teat and a valve attached or capable of being attached to such bottle or receptacle. In this regard, there was a one confusion that breast pumps, whether they come under the ambit of, but then we find that there is a feeding bottle attached to the breast pump. If that is so, then they again, breast pumps also come under the ambit of uh, the law because uh, these are the things which have been uh, the question, the queries which keep on coming to us uh, from BPN, uh, as a BPNI person. So breast milk pumps, if the bottle is attached, then it, it becomes an offense under IMS Act. Promotion means to employ directly or indirectly any method of encouraging by any person to purchase the use of infant substitute, feeding bottle or infant food, so initially the definition said uh, TV and uh, pamphlets and everything, but now the internet, the violations have started appearing on internet. So that has become a big medium of, for violation of uh, the violations of IMS Act. Next slide, please. Health worker means any person engaged in health care of mothers, infants, or pregnant women, starting from the front uh, line health workers like Anganwadi, Asha, to the HODs of pediatrics, gynecology, and so on. Healthcare system means an institution or organization engaged either directly or indirectly in health care of mothers, infants, or pregnant women and includes a health worker in private practice, a pharmacy, drugstore. The pharmacy was not included in 1992 uh, Act, but it got included. Pharmacy and drugstores were added in 2003 and any association of health workers. Next, please. So there's, these are some examples of uh, how they promote uh, breastfeeding showing a bonny baby and then depicting it as a very superior food and advertisement outside the uh, chemist shops. You know, chemists are not allowed to display prominently even the baby food egg under the provisions of the egg. They cannot have a commission, extra commission from for prominent display of baby food, infant food substitutes, infant milk substitutes. So these are things and no TV advertisement, no pamphlets, no pamphlets in the garb of nutrition uh, education uh, pamphlets. So and this is, there are some examples. 
again uh, at the law says that no incentive should be given section 4 says no incentive should be given although the further act will also tell you but incentives are, are of many levels no incentives on the sale of product nothing that one bottle free with um, one tin, one tin of baby food or one bottle free uh, one cup free one utensil free or one small packet free 100 gram free with or 100 gram extra free all these violate and also there are uh, there is a ban under other clause to incentives given to the sale person by the company like if previously they used to give a gold coin before we did this case in rotha they used to give gold coin for a uh, certain amount of sales to the sales yes. representative of the baby food company yes Vinesh, i just want to alert you your time is over but please yeah. do it quickly. next okay this this assists donation of products educational materials and equipments donations allowed only to uh, registered uh, orphanages next please and then labeling guidelines are there they are in detail the size the the warning has to be there that mother's milk is best their size and on which face they are to be given they cannot write the names of uh, big uh, organization like who or iap or anything indirectly or even in small letters suggesting that their product is endorsed by these and next please has through it ensures accurate information through educational materials so all these the content of the educational material has to be uh, as per the provisions of the law you cannot write anything or make tall claims displays banned promotion displays in hospitals clinics chemist shop this we have already spoken next please this is uh, section 9.2 is most important for uh, doctors and healthcare workers they cannot have any incentives or any benefits or any sponsorships uh, from the baby food industry this is this is the particular thing which uh, sort of uh, pertains to uh, our uh, medical associations of pediatricians gynecologists so that is it next please uh this bans commission of sales i have already talked about it next please now fssci advisory fssci uh, law also says it is included ims is included in the fssci and the only important thing uh, regarding fssci law is that the clause of fssci says that ims act will be made superior to its provision will be overriding over the fssci if a complaint is done in the fssci but the product also violates or the offense is also uh, against the ims act then the provisions of ims act which are more stringent than the fssci will prevail over the fssci next please bpni is an authorized by government of india and regarding fssci now india's all fsos have been made uh, um, sort of uh, authorized to take complaints against the um, ims act violations so fsos deputy uh, medical superintendent uh, deputy cmos and this new app that is the Sur uh, stanpan suraksha app is a wonderful app but the public at large can if they find violations can uh, sort of report violations of the ims act through this app this is a very beautiful app and uh, we all should know how to use it the only thing is one should be a bit uh, savvy on uh, mobiles because it is better you record a date if you find a violation and if you can post a location Um, uh, sort of uh, thing on the complaint, then it is very good. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Dinesh, uh, for uh, uh, throwing light on the provisions of the IMS Act, and thank you for all the work that you are doing.
in haryana and uh, next i would uh, like to introduce the next session uh, is about uh, is by dr gayatri singh um, on uh, what state governments can do towards implementation or, and uh, monitoring the ims act and uh, let me introduce uh, dr gayatri singh uh, she is the child development uh, specialist uh, for unicef india and uh, she's a professional in the field of public health nutrition and holds a phd degree in nutrition she's currently working as a child development specialist in unicef new delhi in unicef she leads the work on infant and young child feeding she has worked extensively with national and state governments uh, academic institutions and with ngo partners in designing implementing and managing large scale programs for early childhood development and nutrition uh, ma'am you have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation over to you Uh, sorry i was having difficulty unmuting am i audible yeah uh good morning uh, everybody uh it's really an honor for me to join uh, dignitary somebody mentioned on screen and off screen and these are the faces that i see who have been stalwarts uh, and have worked for decades uh, for championing the cause of breastfeeding so indeed a privilege and really humble to be part of this uh, meeting uh why are we so concerned about breastfeeding and i think very rightly uh, dr gupta did mention is that till today it's lot of our children have to wait very long to be put to breast uh and this is despite the fact that we are seeing uh, increase in institutional deliveries so there is a huge opportunity gap that children are not put to breast within the first hour of life and when we look at exclusive breastfeeding for for first 6 months these are also areas where lot of improvements are needed uh reflecting back just to set the context is uh breastfeeding we need to really look at the three different phases initiating establishing and maintaining exclusive breastfeeding when it comes to initiating breastfeeding the early initiation within one hour including the skin to skin contact is an important opportunity the uh, mother staying in the institution the institution can play a critical role in establishing exclusive breastfeeding ensuring that the child is discharged on exclusive breastfeeding and then at for maintaining lot of support is required at the community level to ensure that the mothers are able to breastfeed for the first 6 months of life and uh, what we know is that mothers need support in all spheres it's at the facility level and in the community level in, uh, at their home setting as well as the workplace uh before we come to really looking at the implementation uh what we know from both global uh, experience as well as what is available from the country is what really works in improving breastfeeding at scale is good quality consistent communication the mother and the family needs to hear the same thing from all sources because if the messages are not consistent there is confu- confusion in addition to this is it's messaging once like if we have an intensified efforts during world breastfeeding week and do not back it up with uh, efforts the year round it will not have the desired result so what is required is that these messages are reinforced through multiple contacts multiple contacts could be with the service providers 
also judicious use of uh, media, both print, electronic, and now also in some remote areas, the community radios can also play an important role. Uh, mother's need while breastfeeding is natural. Mother's need skill support uh, to support uh, breastfeeding. And here the role of uh, health service providers is critical. And last but not the least is also uh, breastfeeding needs to be protected from commercial influence. So that's where uh, I will try to focus now. If you look at the IMS Act, uh, this has been done in uh, detail. So first I will look at what is that the health, in the health setting uh, it can be, uh, what can be done in the health setting. Right. Can you do the full screen? Uh, uh, if you I, can. Okay. Yeah, please. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, looking at how, what the, in the health um, care settings uh, can be done to support the act, because as has been said, we have a wonderful instrument and uh, rightly said that probably one of India is one of the country where we have a very comprehensive uh, act. The challenge is how do we ensure this act is implemented uh, and monitored effectively? Uh, why is implementation of the court so critical is, uh, and I'm probably going to draw attention to the current context of COVID where the caregivers, including the service providers might have apprehensions and concerns about safety of breastfeeding in the context of COVID. Mothers need information from trusted source so that they can make informed choice choices about feeding their babies. So it's really helping the mothers to decide uh, what is best for the baby. And all of us uh, know that breastfeeding is the best feeding. It also helps them to overcome their, sorry, it also helps them to overcome misinformation, concerns, and fears. And there is inappropriate uh, marketing of breast milk uh, substitutes, which needs to be um, checked. And uh, again, the fears and concerns of uh, mothers need to be addressed. And uh, let's also be mindful is that during emergencies, donations of breast milk uh, substitutes and, and, and also uh, infant uh, foods is uh, seen, it's prevalent. So, and this might be knowing or unknowing uh, violation. Uh, key things that the uh, health service uh, system can do is, first the health uh, service providers need to understand the act. Uh, and what is coming out very clearly is awareness about the act, the provisions of the act is not so widely known. Uh, including the health system needs to know what are the responsibilities in ensuring that the act is implemented and the mothers are supported to uh, uh, breastfeed. Once this is understood, all uh, the health staff, they need to be supported and trained on uh, the IMS Act, as well as they need to have knowledge and skills to support breastfeeding. So like, it's only not only about monitoring the act or act alone, but also improving the knowledge and skills so that they can provide support to the mothers to overcome the feeding difficulties or the practical difficulties that the mothers face while breastfeeding. Uh, what the states can do is monitor violations, especially in the uh, health establishments uh, to stop inappropriate use of breast milk substitutes and the feeding baby foods. And this is an area which probably needs a greater emphasis because once you start monitoring, you will be able to realize what form of violations are occurring and how this can be uh, checked. Uh, having said this is that there has to be a continuum of support for uh, mothers because uh, just checking at the health facility level is not enough. It needs to be really done even in the community and uh, house level setting. And another is of course the work uh, at, at the workplace. 
donations should not be accepted and sought from uh, uh, from the uh, companies or, or or any baby foods or even the infant milk formula. This is very, very prevalent during emergencies because their donations comes and uh, the authorities do accept this. So this is an area where probably there is a need for education and a strict um, guideline should be there that these are not accepted or even sought. Uh, the, the, the companies are using different ways of uh, promoting their product directly or indirectly. So it's not necessarily that it will be a donation in the form of infant formula or a baby food. It can be other forms of um, uh, donations or sponsorship, like sponsoring of uh, meetings, uh, gifts, or it could be uh, giving cash donations uh, or kind donations. Which, which should not be accepted. Uh, will the, this is important, uh, what, the, what uh, the, the service providers and the government people can do, but is it alone sufficient to uh, ensure effective implementation of the act? No, what is required is also public education. Uh, families need information from a credible information which is unbiased. So the uh, government sector and also the other uh, service providers, whether private and or public, they have a huge role in public education. And th what this will be is educating the, uh, the families, not only mothers, but families, because sometimes the decision on breastfeeding is made by uh, the in-laws uh, or the husbands is really educating the families on benefits of breastfeeding and also what are the risks of uh, uh, infant formula for the child. Uh, some of the initiatives that uh, states are doing uh, to support uh, implementation of the act is having breastfeeding corners. Now, what is happening is when you have visual displays showing of breastfeeding. So as a um, mother who's going to the facility, it's a reinforcement, yes, yes, this facility gives importance to breastfeeding. Not only visual displays, but also ensuring that you have um, a, a cadre of uh, skilled counselors who can support uh, mothers who uh, for uh, providing them skilled counseling. Some of the states are also working on bottle-free zones uh, to promote uh, breastfeeding. And uh, use of um, infant formula, feed, feeding bottles, teeth should be an integral part of facility assessment. And last but not least is this whole uh, public education on importance of breastfeeding and risk of formula feeding. Public education, we should also optimally utilize media, maybe also the print media, because still in number of areas, what is printed is taken as some as a as a uh, you know gospel truth and people do believe it. So let's look at how do we reach information to people on the benefits of uh, breastfeeding and risk of formula feeding. To conclude, uh, we have a good act. We have a number of uh, programs. Uh, now, what is important is to ensure effective implementation so that we ensure that our children are optimally breastfed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri, uh, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you for um, uh, keeping it in time. <laughs> And uh, next, uh, uh, the next session uh, is about role and beauty of uh, the uh, health professionals in government and private sector. Uh, it is by Dr. Uh, Jay Komada. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Jay Komada. Uh, she's an expert advisor uh, of child health, NHM Tamil Nadu, and uh, uh, the professor and HOD of neonatology at Shavita Medical College. Uh, she is also the Central Coordination Committee member for BPNI. Her area of interest includes infant and young child feeding, KMC, neonatal intensive care, uh, 
uh, neonatal uh, transport, human milk banking. She's the recipient of many accolades like Active uh, Pediatrician Award I, from IAP in 2001, uh, then uh, the award by EMRI for organizing neonatal transport into uh, in Tamil Nadu in 2012, uh, neonatal fellowship uh, uh, at the Central NNF 2014, and the best government doctor Tamil Nadu 2017. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Napur. Uh, I'll just start sharing the screen. Uh, thank you. I am very, very happy to be part of this webinar on protection of breastfeeding. What's our role and whose uh, responsibility is that? And uh, I'm really also to be part of this uh, very elite group of people who have worked hard for promoting breastfeeding in our country. Thank you. Ma'am, you have 10 minutes. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but you have 10 minutes. Thank yeah. you. Uh, role of health system and health worker, we are going to see. And if you look at, uh, despite the IMS Act, we see a lot of violations and uh, the legislations seem to seldom affect the manufacturers. And what we notice is only tip of the iceberg and we see a lot of unnoticed violations which are happening directly and indirectly. As Dr. Dinesh said, uh, sister concern and all uh, is still happening. So we have to enlighten our health role, uh, health workers so that they are very, very uh, alert and they properly implement the IMS Act. And uh, these are the violations, what amounts to, which was explained by Dr. Dinesh. And uh, we see that the digital platform is being very much used uh, by the health workers, uh, by the industry to uh, involve the health worker indirectly or directly promoting their products. So this is one thing which we should be really alert to and which we have to uh, be careful. And also though FSSA uh, for all the states has been given, their role seems to be very, very minimal. And they, uh, at the district level, even in the uh, state of breastfeeding trends initiative, which we did for Tamil Nadu, we found that the district action of FSSA, I, or the food safety officers seem to be not optimal. And the definition of healthcare system and health worker was already told by Dr. Dinesh. I won't go into it. What we have to also understand that pharmacy and drugstore is also added part of the healthcare system and also clinics, private clinics also or uh, clinic OPD also is included in the healthcare system. And section eight, uh, this uh, healthcare role of healthcare and healthcare system is much dealt in section eight, which blinds display of placards or posters relating to IMS Act in health facilities. So they can't use the health facilities and to display placards. And many a time they use indirectly immunization cards. Uh, the, our child health records are being used for uh, promoting their products because it's given to all the uh, government and private institutions and they feel very happy health workers to get a card which is nicely printed and they use it uh, with their logo of the industry so that has to be taken care of and we should be very wary of it and again section subsection two of this section eight also uh, says that no inducement in the form of payment to any healthcare system or health worker for promoting the use or the sale. And again, section three, they, these are things which as health worker, they should be aware of. Other than the health worker, no other person from the industry can demonstrate uh, infant food, uh, milk foods or substitutes uh, to their mothers and also to their family. The health worker also is supposed to clearly tell them the hazards of bottle feeding or formula feeds in case they have to resort to use that. So this is what one important thing, demonstration 
uh, cannot be done by the industry people. And even if the health worker explains this, that they have to explain the hazards of uh, internal milk substitutes and uh, the bottle feed. Again, subsection four bans on distribution of milk substitutes. No organization or person or can receive uh, these free samples or samples at a subsidized rate uh, for, for our mothers who cannot breastfeed or if they are going to uh, use artificial feed and they cannot afford. So this is very, very important section. Free supplies cannot be given to the mothers or the family. Then section five says that an orphanage may purchase infant milk substitutes at a price lower than that only if it is for their own use. And again, coming to the section nine bans on inducement to the health worker in the for promoting sales or use or recommending it to the parents. And uh, in most importantly, funding and seminars, meeting, conferences, educational course, contests and fellowship or research. We know many incidences where uh, Industries have been found or caught uh, helping research. Even ICMR had to intervene after BPNA reported to the Ministry of Health uh, to withdraw those studies in five centers in India. So, and most of the time now pediatricians and neonatologists are little more aware of the IMS Act. Now they are catching super specialists. They think that super specialists uh, are sort of immune uh, to their thing. So they get a lot of super specialists in the garb of saying nutrition, pediatric nutrition and things like that. And they get uh, those uh, inducement is being given to super specialists. So we should be aware of that. And again, the most important thing I feel the role both by the government and by the uh, health system is training on IMS Act. See, we don't have this IMS Act included in pre-service curriculum, especially medical nursing. Nursing does not have it at all. Even in an undergraduate MBBS course, the IMS Act is not given any importance in the curriculum. And paramedical course, they don't even have heard about IMS Act. So this is one area in the medical education where we have to concentrate and include it in the pre-service curriculum. And even when we do in-service training of uh, when we cover IYCF, adequate time has to be covered for IMS Act and also separately, definitely once a person, especially health workers who are working in the field of maternal and child health, have to be uh, trained on IMS Act and what are the violations. Unless they understand what is a violation, they really don't understand. They think, okay, this sample given, they can accept and give it to the mother. After all, it's going to improve nutrition. That is their concept and thinking. So this has to be dispelled. And again, when we say health staff, it is not only the frontline and the middle level. Uh, we always tend to train the frontline and the middle level. But I feel even the top, it is to, from bottom to top has to be trained all the people. And also another area of uh, uh, place, which we tend to forget is the nutrition students. There is a large number of nutrition students who are, especially during this period of World Breastfeeding Week, they are given a lot of sponsorship to start doing the celebration. So they go to the colleges where nutrition education happens and this is being done. So again, we have to alert them. And also again, in their pre-service curriculum, it has to be included. And again, administrators, see, we would be surprised that the top four administrators, uh, administrators of health, maternal health or related uh, uh, areas do not know that IMS Act exists and it's a violation. They would offer even sponsoring milk banks uh, in the form uh, inducement. And uh, many things, medical libraries, because they get, HODs get a very uh, important books are given to them so they think they can accept. So administrators have also have to be briefed and sensitized about the IMS Act and what is amounting to a violation. 
and then refresher training see it's a uh, one time uh, training is not adequate so we have to have periodic refresher training at least every year or at least every two years so that already trained uh, could continue to have uh, uh, updated knowledge on breastfeeding protection and again follow ims act sincerely again if we have to follow follow ims act sincerely as uh, dr gayatri said we they should have a basic knowledge of how to help a woman and counsel a woman to successfully breastfeed so that is another added skill which is also to be present in the health worker and not only do we get empowered we also have to empower our colleagues uh, whatever level it, uh, everybody thinks only the junior level has to be done but even at the senior level we need to empower them uh how to protect breastfeeding and how to identify a violation and then uh report and then discourage promotion of infant milk substitutes very very important uh it uh, see at the hospital level and at the uh, health worker level is that is the most vulnerable point of entry to the industry so they try to induce if one person is not accepting the next person is approached and they enter into the departments so that has to be discouraged and identify violation again as dr dinesh said or dr arun said uh, violation has to be identified and many a time many people identify violations but they don't have the courage to report it somewhere so uh, we have this mobile app of tanpan suraksha where they can easily identify that no action would be taken against them they are very apprehensive of what will happen if they report so that assurance is given to them and they can report and many a time in, in you are going to be a faculty to any of the conference or seminar or workshop it would be a very good idea to check before like uh, whom we are accepting is there any sponsorship which is being given uh, to that a workshop or seminar this uh, many a time my juniors say madam we did it without our knowledge we didn't know that this was a sponsoring person so we have to check each time once you become a faculty in any of the national or international or uh, state level conferences or any level uh, and check that no sponsorship is got from infant milk substitutes and resist sponsorship see when we are conducting the organizing secretary of any conferences uh, they uh, give lot of sums as sponsorship they offer so that has to be resisted and funding we can generate or fund or we can conduct conferences within our budget and there is no need to accept sponsorship from the infant milk substitutes and again refuse uh, free gifts we have had industry people giving very very indoors of very very good gifts to all the people who are promoting so that has to be refused and has to be uh, told how we are arming all children and protection of mothers also if breastfeeding is not done and again guide your administrators many a time the administrators also get carried away by the offers given by the industry so they want to accept many things like uh, uh, organizing a kmc ward organizing a human milk bank organizing uh, some refurbishing of the unit these are inducements which is given to the uh, administrators which uh, have we have to guide them and say this is wrong we can't accept and we have to raise our own funding for whatever uh, improvement we have to do in the hospitals or in the healthcare system this is one area which we have to do many a time we have Uh, guided our administrators that such a thing cannot be accepted and it is violation of IMS Act. We have to brief them on the whole thing. So this is what we have to do, and administrators keep changing, and we have to continue to do that. And dissemination at all levels. See, we now we are trying to do it at the national level, state level, district level, and even at the village at the home level. The public should be having. I think now they use the digital. platform for their promotion i feel we should use the digital platform and keep on talking every day and uh, we have i was really uh, happy this time our chief minister himself gave a message on uh, infant and young child guidelines as a message uh, to be aired in the tv and the all india radio so like that if 
or the politician, the ruler, or if they really take up the initiative and disseminate to the public level where the reach is very high, then it would be very useful. Thank you. So I think we should continue to do it at all levels, coupled with breastfeeding skills, helping a mother to support breastfeeding and do the monitoring, then I think we would uh, get away and then we'll be able to protect more children and mothers and then help them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupata. Um, the next uh, session is on why uh, should we monitor the IMS Act and it is by Dr. Sunita Kartyan, who is a pediatrician uh, from Ranchi, uh, Jharkhand. Let me introduce Dr. Sunita Kartyan. She's a pediatrician from Ranchi uh, and she has done uh, her MD from uh, Symbiosis Pune. Breastfeeding. Yes, sir. I don't think Sunita has been able to join as a panelist. No, I have given her the link just now on her phone. Let her join. She has also shared. Let her join. I don't think she is there at the panelist. So how will she present? That's my question. I mean, we are introducing her. Is okay. okay, let me check with her once again because I've just given her the link. I am on the that how to I, there is a promote to panelist a provision in the group. If you do that, yes. Sunita, can you, can you hear us, Sunita? VPN, I, Yashika, can you bring her on uh, from the, she yes, is sir. There. Yes, I'm doing that. Yes, sir. She's there now. Yeah. Yeah, Sunita, thanks. Okay. For, yeah. Okay. Okay. Welcome, ma'am. Can you hear us? Should I go ahead with her introduction? Please go ahead. Uh, Sunita, can you hear us? Sunita, can you open your She's camera? On mute. She's on mute. Yashika, if you could. Yeah, hello, hello. Hello, I'm sorry for this Perfect. last minute confusion. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Huh. Welcome, ma'am. Thank, uh, so Thank you. Let me introduce you. And we yeah, are about yeah, to start your session. So, uh, Dr. Sunita Kartan is a breastfeeding friendly pediatrician practicing and doing lactation consultancy and IYCF consultancy since uh, the last four decades in Ranchi, Jharkhand. She's the master trainer in the 4 in 1 TOT of intranial child feeding by BPNI. She's also a qualified public health nutrition expert and an active member of Right to Food campaign, a uh, Jharkhand group of Supreme Court uh, of India. In pediatric practice, she's in pediatric practice since 1985, as well. Um, as attached to a hospital and looks after the newborn and children up to 18 years, their health and nutrition issues with dedicated counseling and dealing with these issues. Uh, she's an ex-member of the Jharkhand State Commission for Child Rights and she's also one of the founder members of EPNI. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Ma'am, yes. Ma'am, you have and 10 I'll, minutes. Yes, I'll just share the content. Just a minute, I'm not being able to share my want me to share your share your slides? No, I think now it'll come. Okay. Can you see? Can you all see what is on the screen? Yes, we can. It shows uh, you're sharing the screen. 
some boost is happening. I think Arun will share my uh, presentation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk about why we should be monitoring this uh, act. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of y'all on this. Uh, on this uh, platform where all of y'all who are so interested in uh, promoting uh, breastfeeding and monitoring uh, how it is going. Now, the reason why we have to share, the, uh, why we have to man monitor the IMS Act is very ob obvious because any law that we have has to reflect what is the present situation. And to make this law a success, we have to have political desire to enact this strong legislation. So political will is actually the name of the game. And the government in power or any government has to support whoever it is designating to monitor it and ensure its speedy implementation. But if it doesn't, then what happens that corruption and or abuse of power happens and then violations start happening and the baby food companies start uh, fishing in the troubled waters. Now, what is the... Uh, um, things, uh, challenges that we have. The challenges are many, but the biggest challenge that we have is undermining by incentives and marketing from infant formula companies. They have such a huge budget to market that it becomes very difficult to uh, sometimes counter that, uh, this. And at the same time, we have to also evaluate those bodies that are monitoring this act because then we want to be sure that what is being done is being done in the proper way. Next. Now, what? Uh, um, who are the people who are going to benefit from this? Violation? It's obviously the milk food companies and you can see how, uh, according to their market share, how many of them there are. There are many Indian players also now trying to get into this market. Next. And who benefits? Uh, who loses? actually, who loses is the babies because there is a, such a drastic decline in breastfeeding. And you can see that this is the time when the breast milk substitutes marketing was its peak, at this peak. And there was such a catastrophic uh, decline in the uh, rates of breastfeeding in these countries. Next. So um, what happens after that is if you have a law in place, you can see the difference it makes. Here are figures which are showing the use of milk formula at different times. Uh, and over the years in the early 2000s, when the IMS Act was in uh, force and other efforts were also being made. And you can see how the consumption has increased exponentially in China, whereas it has remained almost the same. Now, this is a, a next. Now here I'm going to share a personal experience of mine in monitoring the act. This is one of the conferences I went to and there I saw a display of baby uh, milk substitutes with the um, logo that the metabolic formula portfolio is being shown. But actually speaking, they were under this umbrella showing all the other things also that were happening, all the other kinds of uh, breast milk substitutes possible. So I reported it to the monitoring agency, BPNI in this instance. And as a result of it, there was a huge public mix, public um, outcry and advocacy. And then the FSSAI had to come up and clarify that actually it was, uh, uh, it was uh, just three formulae for maple syrup disease phenylketonuria and galactosuria, which were allowed. And they had started using this to promote even the other things. And so actually speaking, uh, it was made clear that marketing of all these products still comes under the IMS Act. And as Dr. Koshla has already said, that the IMS Act is supervenes any other act that is present. So our law is actually hailed as one of the most effective laws in anywhere in the world 
against the promo advertising and marketing of breast milk uh, substitutes. Next. Now, next. Now what happens that we have to worry about how is this baby food industry motivated and what is the modus apparently that it is using? So actually speaking, we have to go beyond just uh, monitoring the marketing. We know that this is a huge and global industry. It, and it does this by creating a need where none exists. They then convince the uh, consumer that, you know, them, our products are indispensable by the advertisements and all. And then they leak the products with the most desirable and unattainable concepts. Then quietly slip in a sample. So what happens is that the, the people who are using these products, they don't know how the company is going. And the company itself is not at all bothered about the health of its consumers. Now, what uh, uh, when you, but the thing is that they are still doing, they are still produce uh, next, they are still um, uh, breaking the law as much as possible. The other problem is that many people think that consuming these products, especially in places where there is not too much of hygiene, uh, of a hygiene problem, means that there is no problem for the mothers and the children. But that is a serious error. You have to think in terms of a food which is also functional. It should do all the things that it claims to do. And if it is not doing it, then it's harming the person. So you have to monitor the baby food industry, not in terms of safety also, but also how effective it is. And there are very few agencies who are actually telling parents or consumers about or the society at large key, what is the benefit of the breast milk and what are the disadvantages of next of the um, formula feed. Now, when uh, what is the task ahead? What do we want to do when we uh, actually monitor? We want to be sure that the parents know that consumption of formula is does not improve the health of the mother. It worsens the health of the mother and the child. Next slide, please. And that these products actually have cognitive impacts which last a lifetime and even impact future generations. And a great deal of attention has been given also. Um, and no, sorry, uh, we need to give a great deal of attention on whether it is nutritionally adequate. So these are tasks that we have ahead of us when we are monitoring the act. And here we have BPNI's Stanpan Suraksha app, which has already been talked about on how you can use it to monitor the act. Next. So we want everybody to be aware of that, not just health personnel or parents or drugs and pharmaceuticals. We want the film industry to be aware of that. We want businesses to be aware of that and how, what their business practices are going to impact the health of the society. And we also want to be sure that when we are monitoring this act, we are able to impact international trade and other relations depending, I mean, if you are, in a trade where uh, if you are in, in a treaty where you are importing a large amount of uh, milk food substitute and uh, breast milk substitutes, it is automatic that that is going to be distributed. So we should be able to also monitor that. Next. And whenever we are looking at outcomes, we must be able to I tell the parents that there are other ways to feed breast milk. Even if you are not able to feed yourself, there are other ways like milk banks, etc. And we have to improve the quality of information that we are giving the parents. And what is very important is prevent these large companies from having a, a say in public governance. They have, uh, they can sway governments and influence people to their own benefits. But what have we good things that we have done by monitoring is the, uh, when we were doing promotional, educational and training activities in, in IOICF and BPNI was in the forefront, we, the uh, breastfeeding rates have jumped from 36.8 to 64.9 in 2014. Now, 
where do we stand internationally? We are in a very good situation in the sense that we are only one of the 36, 136 countries that have a strong law in place. We are one of the 51 that prevents distribution of low cost samples. And we are one of the 19 that prohibits sponsorship and uh, uh, gifts to medical personnel. So we should monitor this act because we want to get it implemented because we want to amend and update it, because we want to prevent misuse of that. We want to find out if there are any gaps, we want to fill them. We want to see if it is in keeping with whatever is the present practice and uh, knowledge. And last, but very important, is that we want to see, be sure that there is no conflict of interest in any of the groups that are concerned with this act. Now, there are some suggestions from my side, which I feel if we could incorporate eventually, then it would make a great difference. One of them is that if we could move breastfeeding into the human rights framework, where breastfeeding is a right to health, is attached to the right to health, we could have a national law that moves breast milk substitutes from a food into drugs, because then once it is a drug, then you have to also monitor its effectivity. And if you are monitoring effectivity, you are talking about uh, whether it's nutritionally adequate, and we all know where that stands. And then as it was done in certain companies, in certain countries, you have an IYCF commission, like they had in Nicaragua when they started promoting breastfeeding, which overlooks everything concerned with uh, feeding young children, and that would also include all those packaged and ultra processed foods along with breast milk. And as we all know nowadays, with uh, even children less than two years, have started consuming all these things. So these are. This is why I feel that it is very necessary that along with implementation, and uh, we must continuously monitor this act so that we know uh, we can keep changing with the times. Thank you. My next slide, here we have a little fellow who is uh, saying breast milk is the choice for a new generation. And uh, this is from an organization called Boobies, breastfeeding our own babies in every situation. And I think that's the right uh, spirit of the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sunita. Uh, for your presentation. Moving on uh, with the agenda, the next session is about uh, practices of baby food companies and how industry continues uh, uh, to interfere with the policy. And uh, this uh, presentation would be by Dr. Vandana Prasad. And I would like to introduce Dr. Vandana Prasad. Uh, Dr. Vandana Prasad is a community pediatrician and a public health professional and has been engaged with the social sector for over 25 years now. Her main experience and expertise is in the area of malnutrition, health system strengthening and child rights. And she has many publications uh, on these uh, to her credit. Uh, she's the founding secretary and technical uh, advisor public health resource of the public health resource network society public health resource society and has been the national convener uh, for public health resource network for over 10 years from inception till 2020 she has been a joint national convener of people's health movement india janswasthya abhiyan and an active member of the right to food campaign dr prasad has also served the government of india as member child health and national commission for protection of child Right. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks very much, Nupur. I'm just going to start, to start to share my screen. And while I do that, let me just say that it's a, it's a privilege to be here. Great honor. Um, as everybody has said. Yeah. Do you see that? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So uh, again, thanks very much. And thank you to the previous speakers for raising many, many very important issues. Uh, I think that there's a chance that many of us are going to be saying very similar things and uh, how baby food companies have been interfering with policy and practice has already been mentioned by practically every speaker that has uh, gone before. I'll try to add some elements that have not come up previously so that I don't uh, repeat uh, uh, too much. And uh, just to make clear you know, what my standpoint is, I am still a, a primary pediatrician and I do a clinic uh, in poor communities in Delhi, uh, in Zamrutpur. 
and uh, I have been a policy advocate for uh, child health uh, for as long as Nupur said. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. And uh, let me just try to um, take you through some issues that I would like to raise here. Okay. These curses are very slow on the screen, yeah. So uh, the presentation is going to take us through some violations, but since violations have been largely discussed already, I'm just going to race through them. You will find that, uh, you know, uh, it's telling that we are all saying similar things. We're giving similar um, examples and even using similar photographs. And you have to think why, uh, because this really harkens to the question that I'll bring in at the end of the presentation, which is to do with the nature of monitoring that's uh, currently going on in the country. So I'm going to bring you back to that issue. Why is it that we have these few examples that all of us are forced to be using? It's a very important question. Then the connivance of the medical community. I think many speakers have mentioned this. Uh, I will bring in a few um, uh, uh, points that have not been raised so far, uh, as well as industry interference in policy, which again has been mentioned by a few speakers. Uh, so a few extra points on that as well. This is the last presentation. So in some sense, it is filling gaps. Yeah, so uh, it has been mentioned that, you know, selling on discount is not permitted within the IMS Act and uh, all these companies are doing it again and again, even though the discount may be just a rupee off. So, you know, the consumer doesn't get that much, but what they get is eyeballs upon uh, uh, their products because sales are what really draw attention. So a very, very clever marketing technique here on selling on discount. You can see it's just, just a rupee off uh, in most of these products. Um, free supplies. Uh, during relief work, this is a very important point, and you know it comes up again uh, in the context of our current uh, pandemic situation. Any uh, disaster, any disaster at all, whether it be floods or drought or anything, uh, amongst all the relief supplies that are made, uh, no attempt to promote breastfeeding and a very quick uh, decision to kind of distribute breast milk substitutes again and again. Yeah, this is somewhere in the northeast, as you can perhaps make out. Um, this is in Chandigarh, again, a free supply of uh, breast milk substitutes and baby food sponsorships. Many people have spoken about, but what's telling is that in this photograph, this, these photographs are thanks to BPNI and, um, and one particular report, the most recent that they have published. This is the ex CEO of FSSAI, uh, an institution that keeps coming up again and again. And I'm going to say a little bit more about FSSAI's role in uh, nutrition policy currently in the country. Um, more sponsorships, so these are health workers from Apollo Hyderabad, I believe, uh, being sponsored to attend um, a conference on clinical nutrition practice. Sponsorship of professional bodies, it was so good to hear from uh, IAP that, you know, currently, uh, thanks to a lot of effort by a lot many people, but also spearheaded by uh, Dr. Piyush Gupta, that no longer are we accepting any donations. It has taken just decades and decades of constant struggle for this uh, with uh, you know, BPNI and many of us in the forefront actually practicing uh, pediatricians. And one fears that when the leadership changes again, it is so very tempting to go back into these practices because the issue is one of you know, money. And I think um, uh, a doctor who spoke previously, she, she was so very correct that we do have the capacity to find our own funding. And we don't have to be having conferences in five stars, uh, five star hotels and spending a whole lot of money uh, in a country like India. And we can certainly do a better job. So this is really something that makes many of us very, very sad. Uh, this point that hasn't come up previously is the use of social media bloggers. And you know, um, again, uh, uh, um, an alliance against conflict of interest, uh, uh, which again is being spearheaded by the same uh, champions. You know, Dr. Arun Gupta is in the in the lead in uh, in that as well has been uh, complaining to um, uh, actors and uh, people who are very much in the public eye who've been you know, supporting some of these companies. So this is another uh, well-known tactic that uh, some very known public figure is picked up and uh, asked to support these. They do it, they do it naively, uh, thinking that they're doing the public uh, you know, some big favor by promoting something that seems uh, ostensibly to be good for them. So, uh, and many of these have been then taken back. Uh, I think there's a context of Amitabh Bachchan and others uh, who have been uh, uh, some of our cricket players who were induced to do this kind of um, uh, advertising. Yeah, again, trying to get to my cursor, which goes missing. Yeah, there we are. Yes, and uh, one speaker mentioned this. This was very dramatic. Uh, 
a research grant by Nestle to uh, through the ICMR to five hospitals to do research on nutrition. And this was not even uh, you know, a sister company because as I will come to, one of the major tactics used by uh, these companies is they, they start NGOs, they start foundations for nutrition. Uh, the parent companies are very much the same. The funding sources are the same. Even Tata's has been doing that for a period of time through Tata Trusts and so on. So, uh, but here it's not even that. That even that face-saving device is not here. So you see Nestle India Limited directly approaching ICMR to fund, um, and this was this was actually passed and was taken back when um, uh, again uh, uh, many of us led by BPNI, uh, BPNI playing a stellar role again and again in all these. Um, uh, uh, raised a big hue and cry. None of this can happen, uh, you know, without the participation of the medical community. And many speakers have been saying this in different ways. It's just not possible to go ahead because the public relies on their doctors to advise them. And, uh, it, you know, if the doctor says, don't do this, uh, I doubt that there'd be very many people who would, uh, you know, spontaneously do it unless they are pressurized by circumstances. And here I would like to make this point that breastfeeding does depend on um, uh, community support, social support and government support, because even the most motivated of women uh, and all women and all poor women are working women um, are not able to uh, successfully breastfeed without support such as maternity leave, maternity entitlements and so on. But yet, I think doctors play a very major role. And in my practice, as a primary practitioner, I see that time and time again, poor women coming to me saying, a doctor told me uh, to not breastfeed my baby. And this is even in the current circumstances. Why does this happen? Uh, there are some contexts, uh, you know, which offer some genuine difficulties, but yet can be uh, transcended. Uh, for example, very common uh, uh, thing that is suggested. And, you know, one thing I want to say is that most of this malpractice we are seeing more and more in non-teaching private hospitals, small nursing homes, uh, you know, single doctor clinics and so on. Yes, the teaching hospitals are doing a, a fairly uh, better job and being much more careful. So one context that comes up again and again is cesarean section, where the babies are immediately separated from women and uh, put in, uh, you know, in a nursery and then immediately given either dextrose or a breast milk substitute uh, for the first 24 hours. Uh, the other examples given by uh, medical practitioners is infection transmission to the baby that, you know, you're, you're infected, you have TB, so on and so forth. And we know that most of these are not valid reasons um, uh, to prevent breastfeeding, but uh, the practitioners still go ahead to use these as examples. And a lot in the poor communities, which we hear is that you're too weak, uh, your breast milk is not good enough, you, you know yourself that you're very weak, so please don't breastfeed. Where that money that is going to breast milk substitutes would be far better used uh, for improving the nutrition quality of the woman herself. So uh, these are the kinds of contexts that are used. What are the influences? I think the commercial influence people have spoken about at length, and that is, that is primary and overriding, but there are others as well. There is the general feeling of superiority uh, that you know uh, products, medical products bring to, and doctors use those medical products. We use drugs. I think there was a suggestion to make breast uh, milk a drug. I would uh, strongly kind of resist that kind of view because we have to go back to the idea that breastfeeding, breast milk, this is all part of nature. It's all part of our history. It's all part of um, uh, you know, how uh, animals and organisms really continue. And uh, if we convert that, this into drugs, we're really falling into this trap of saying this is something technical. Uh, this is something that uh, you know, uh, has to be uh, uh, taken care of by um, uh, uh, regulatory framework upon quality and so on. Uh, so I think that th that is problematic. I think we have to continue to push for breastfeeding to be a very natural thing and yet being qualitatively better. Uh, so uh, whereas the medical community is trained to think that drugs and medical products are what really tackle disease and illness. I mean, that, that's a part of, the, part, part of being a medical practitioner. And unfortunately, they take it, uh, they extend that to breastfeeding also. Um, and then there are some conflicts and competitions, I think. There's a person from Foxy here. She may uh, uh, not think that this happens, but I think in smaller setups, definitely there is a tussle over who owns the baby in inverted commas when the baby is born and um, pediatricians often don't uh, have a say. Somebody has asked in the chat box also whether this is a matter of genuine ignorance. I really doubt it. I think in this day and age with so much uh, you know, happening uh, in terms of training of doctors and so much public uh, opinion and so on. If there is a genuine ignorance, well, it's all our responsibility to get rid of this as fast as possible. 
Now, uh, I think not much has been said about uh, the pandemic, but people have hinted at it. So when people have discussed what has hindered breastfeeding uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, again, uh, you can see that there are social, economic, corporate and health system forces affecting, you know, so everything that we have been talking about in general that has hindered and hampered breastfeeding uh, has been exacerbated during the pandemic. This is, uh, this is something that all of us must note. And so what are these factors? The social and economic factors that are at the level of the uh, you know, family and community, I'm not going to go into so much because we are talking about the regulatory framework, but health systems, uh, again, separation of COVID-19 mothers from their babies and babies from their mothers, uh, something that the health system could have taken care of during the pandemic, the initial resistance to uh, lactating to vaccinating lactating mothers, which so many mothers would, might have decided to give up on lactation uh, because they opted for uh, vaccination. Not so much in our country, but I think um, because vaccination hasn't really gone forward, but potentially, I mean, these are the policy issues that the government could have taken care of right at the start. Um, and of course, all disruption of community level counseling, which everybody agrees is so very important. So, um, uh, you know, the Anganwadis are not working, uh, a &Ms and so on are completely distracted. So all the babies who've been born in this period are really missing out on all this skilled counseling that we've been talking about. Now, just a little bit on this, uh, you know, how industry interferes in law and policy. Again, the same example has been used by many, but I think the point that I want to make here is that it is very difficult to evidence these uh, processes simply because organi the organization's concern or the corporate industry that is concerned is very clever at doing this. And like I said, they create many, many layers of organization, uh, which finally result in an NGO. They say that the management is different and so on and so forth. And yet conflict of interest continues. And the basic, when you track the money is where you see that they still continue to have a lot of influence, but it is very difficult to track. And so therefore all sympathy with any entity that is trying to monitor how conflict of interest uh, happens within bodies that are there for uh, policy creation. And which are those bodies also we need to see. So just to give an example, uh, for companies, look at the companies, Abbott, Danone, uh, Johnson, Nestle, they combined hands and they launched an NGO. Now this NGO was called Infant and Young Child Nutrition Council of India. And they then joined hands with NNF, the neonatal, um, uh, National Unital Foundation, as well as FSSAI, a body that keeps coming up again and again in this entire discussion. And I want to uh, you know, end with something on that. Um, so, so they uh, joined hands and they were uh, formally invited onto FSSAI into one of the steering committees yeah, to, to lead a partnership called Diet for Life. So they are advising FSSAI on Diet for Life. And one of the issues that they brought up, uh, so yeah, they beca became part of a key committee, the Extended Steering Committee. And they started to seek exemptions from the IMS Act for a very specific case, uh, ostensibly, which was for foods for special medical purposes. I think as mentioned by Sunita, that in some uh, things like galactosemia and so on, you need to be using breast milk substitutes. But the point being, why do you need to amend the IMS Act? Nobody's saying that we are banning all these infant milk substitutes. What is being said is you can't, uh, you can't promote, you can't advertise, so on and so forth. Why do we need to amend the IMS Act to be bringing in something that already exists and is in use already? So this was the question. And again, uh, there was a public hue and cry. Uh, one of our champions now, Rema Nagarajan wrote about this. This uh, photograph has been used by a previous speaker. So, uh, and finally, after two years of struggling, um, uh, this was withdrawn. And these companies uh, through these uh, foundations and so on, which were also openly sponsoring NNF, that uh, sponsorship was also finally withdrawn. Now, the basic questions from this entire presentation that I'm trying to make is there's some very, very fundamental questions. You can see that we have just a handful of people who are you know, uh, monitoring this act. And even the act itself defines uh, you know, the monitoring to be by these handful of people. Uh, uh, primarily NGOs. And primarily within those NGOs, it has been the BPNI, as we all know. Is it really an NGO's responsibility to carry the weight of monitoring such a critical act, which has such critical impact uh, uh, potentially upon such critical sections of our uh, you know, society and our uh, population, the entire uh, you know, women population, practically speaking, and the entire baby population, practically speaking, with implications upon all of future life? 
and an NGO is supposed to sit and monitor this. I think that it's time that we demand that the government takes this responsibility seriously. If the act is to be amended, maybe it should just highlight this, that it is the government's you know, job to be proactively regulating. We, we have not come across a single example where a government body uh, monitored uh, any of this and, uh, and raised a hue and cry and forced industry to step back. It has always happened at the uh, behest of the, the civil society community. So I think it's time that we place it firmly. This is our government. Government's job is to regulate its own acts uh, and its own laws, and it, it should be asked to do so. And finally, why is FSSAI, which is predominantly a standard setting safety body, to be leading the policy making for nutrition? And with all its you know, committees, with all their conflicts of interest and its invitation to uh, industry again and again, we've had Coke, we've had Pepsi, and then we have fought and then they have gone away. But really, is this the way for nutrition policy to be built in this country? How is it that a standard setting agency is doing this? Uh, I think nutrition policy deserves much larger framework of uh, discussion uh, and um, uh, you know, debate, uh, and then finally to be consolidated and clinched at the level of parliament not at the level of FSSAI. And I think that these are the fundamental questions that will have to be resolved before we see, we have seen this great act, this great pioneering act. And we have also seen a big failure of uh, implementation and regulation. But I think that unless we uh, kind of resolve these fundamental issues, we're not going to be able to uh, get uh, much further. We are getting some way further, you know, by the goodness of our hearts and so on. But to do this, you know, strongly, consistently and raise it from, uh, whatever 30 40 percent to 90 percent which is very doable i think that's what we need so thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity again this is a homeless child a very common sight that we all continue to see yeah thanks a lot vandana for your uh, very enlightening uh, presentation highlighting uh, the the role which i think there was the the last point which you made on the the, the responsibility, where lies the responsibility? It answers that question, which the World Breastfeeding Week theme has raised this time in terms of its, its, its uh, BP. And I that thought that it, it should be where lies the responsibility because the moment we continue to say shared responsibility, which looks good, but then it becomes, you know, the government has the duty to do it and, and it puts on the job to the others. Unfortunate part is that the law mentions that NGOs and then every, like a, a class one officer of the government should be gazetted everywhere. It's only after 30 years that we have, we are hearing that one notification has come out of food safety authority that every food safety officer is gazetted to monitor this law. But uh, we haven't, as you rightly said, we haven't yet seen or heard any monitoring done by any government agency or a government person and reported in that sense. So I think even the government fails to act on what we report. But the point is that it's a criminal offense. It's a cognizable offense, which requires investigation. For example, we as the monitors might find somebody is violating this law we would need to investigate it. We would need a legal expertise to do that. We do that, but ultimately it has to go to the police. It has to go to the criminal court to be able to recognize that this is a violation and then only the court can proceed for further criminal trial in this. So the government fails to, we have reported so many in last, just for last three, two years, I think with 30, 30 violations we have reported to the government, which many of you have shown today also. And in writing, we have reported to the government, but government has not taken any initiative except writing a letter to you know, this uh, government uh, to the another government. But as far as the investigation is concerned, I haven't, haven't seen any order by any of the government agencies so far that this is a violation we need to investigate. And once you investigate, you can launch a prosecution. And only, that's the only way to go. So thanks a lot. I will now uh, uh, take the role of uh, moderation of the questions and uh, 
um, some of the questions you people have already answered, but I think uh, uh, one of the questions with the, which is right on there on the top is about the vigilance. I think we, we have answered it well. And uh, of course, more vigilance is required. I mean, people who are vigilant, you know, we have been noticing for 30 years, it's not that everybody needs to be, but there are people who are concerned, they are vigilant, they keep on reporting and it goes on. So another question comes is, which has been answered is the people want anonymity in reporting. Yes, BPNI is clearly of this, uh, you know, keeps uh, all the reports which come to us, we keep the complainant as an anonymous. We do not report the name of the complainant to the government. We only report on a factual thing, what is a violation which is being. So anybody who would report on the app or write an email to BPNI, which is simple, BPNI at BPNI.org, we will keep it anonymous. So it records will be kept secret within BPNI. The next is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, people appreciate uh, what all the participants have presented, all the panelists have presented. Uh, uh, somebody has suggested, Vivek uh, Yadav has suggested that, you know, these should be uh, very clearly available uh, view on 108 or 105 mobile vans carrying pregnant women to hospitals that these are banned. So then there is an anonymous uh, question. Uh, what are the regulation for prescription of formula food by pediatricians? They prescribe the formula due to lack of lactation knowledge and skill. So the answer is given by the person themselves. So it's so prescription is not a violation. The prescription comes out of uh, lack of skill, I agree, but prescription also comes due to the uh, nexus between, uh, I'm using the word nexus because it's been going on for years. Vandana also pointed out that the medical community has to be sensitive to this, that whatever they're doing uh, under the influence of industry, they should stop it. Okay, then uh, gripe water, I will not touch the gripe water issues. There, it doesn't come under the preview of IMS Act. Okay. Uh, people agree with you, Vandana, a lot on your presentation and the, particularly in the disaster section. Uh, there is another question, uh, again, informing about ANT, uh, Alive and Thrive, uh, that we, they're working on the undergraduate thing. I have not seen many questions, but more of suggestion. How can BPNI help in spreading awareness regarding IMS Act among functionaries, Anganwadis and Ashas? So this is a question coming from Vandana Sharma. I think she's uh, from Nipsit. Of course, BPNI can support uh, developing the trainers in the country or trainer at the district level or at the state level. Provided resources are available. The problem with BPNI currently is that we are all volunteers. We are not able to do it in a free manner. Nina Ghosh uh, has again come with the appreciation with Vandana Prasad's uh, discussion on responsibility of the government in safeguarding the act. Okay, next is uh, antenatal checkup uh, the doc to inform the doctor who suggests substitutes to be used during pregnancy. I think that if you get into this, the pregnancy, when you people do it during pregnancy, it amounts to promotion, right? Because how do you know that, you know, the baby would need it later on? So this is reducing a bit in the country, but of course, the, the, the point is very valid that pregnancy should be used as a, a period for preparing women towards breastfeeding and supporting them with uh, all the skills. There, is there any provision regarding forensic testing of baby food companies? If anybody has any knowledge, I don't know. Any forensic testing of baby food samples by any dedicated lab? Uh, I don't know, I can say yeah. about this. Yeah, please. When we lodged a case against in the FSSI, mm -hmm. then the food was test, uh, sent for a testing. 
by the FSS, FSSCI laboratory. Okay. So not under IMS Act, but yeah. when we report, and because a common man can report on a plain paper in FSSCI, okay. while we have to go to the uh, through the CMO office for IMS Act. So there, a okay. detailed study as per protocol was right. done by the FSSCI. So as a part of the law, the food standards are tested by FSSCI. There is a provision that Food Safety Act provides. IMS Act is under that for testing those formulas. They can, they, the authorized officers have the power to go and seize the formula from chemist shop or the factories and they can test it. So that- And also was, they can analyze the label. Yeah, they can do anything. I mean, monitoring, full monitoring they can do. Okay, then uh, there's a question from a journalist. Uh, do you feel there is a better awareness of the act that mothers need not be separated from their nursing babies if they contact COVID, as opposed to the last year when many were separated, even at the hospital after delivery? I still see a lot of babies being separated. If anybody wants to comment on that from clinical side, I would welcome this is a question from Nia Bhatt. Uh, she is a journalist who did a story in Lancet last year. I think and Gayatri should uh, clarify on this. I, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, I think that the policy is that they should not be. They should not be. But she's asking, if they, is, there, is there clinically, are you seeing babies? I heard some time back that babies are separated still because of the fear. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, definitely happening. Yeah. People don't come up, uh, we don't have a... Uh, evidence to say, but people are sharing this example on the Facebook or on the WhatsApp or others. And we do get phone calls, you know, but whether they would be willing to talk to the press or not, we are not sure. Uh, yeah, Dinesh, you want to say something? Yeah. In the second wave of COVID, many children were separated from mothers that we know. But once now I am a part of the core group which is discussing about the third wave and more children, but now a policy has been formed that the wards that are being made for children now for COVID in future, they are having that one and a half bed uh, concept than the children of COVID infected mothers or children with COVID disease. Okay. They will not be separated from their mothers. And yeah. there is a provision, official provision made, I think all over India, yeah. that uh, at, in regards to COVID only, but other yes. children are being separated. Nurse. But not if the mother is admitted. It didn't happen in reverse. I noticed this policy. But if the mother has COVID and she goes to an adult ward, the babies are not being permitted. Then. But we have uh, recommended now that uh, infected mothers can breastfeed their children. So neonates, no separation. Again, yes. that concept of one and a half bed uh, for yes. each uh, mother or, or, or a, ch a child when he or she is admitted. Yeah, day before yesterday, Ministry of Health had a had a meeting on this, and they very clearly uh, gave a guidance that there is no need for any separation. So there is a question from Pune uh, asking whether uh, hospitals can who are setting up breast milk banks banks can this have lactation counselors, uh, you know, uh, who, but who are not promoting breastfeeding. <laughs> so this is a, again a moral dilemma. Uh, uh, Vandana, can you take that question? In turn? That people are setting breast milk banks, but they're not supporting breastfeeding. <laughs> I don't know, Arunji. Uh, <laughs> actually, sir, uh, can I answer that? Uh, yeah, Kumbuta ji, please. Sir. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the basic concept is a pers uh, optimal uh, requirement for starting a breast milk bank itself. The institution should promote breastfeeding. Right. If they are unfriendly, they are not baby friendly, I think they, they should not start. And that is one of the requirements of starting breastfeeding. Okay. So I think uh, we can't have anybody who is not pre promoting breastfeeding in the milk bank also. The right. primary job of the person, lactation counselor who is working in the milk bank is to promote breastfeeding. <laughs> in fact, uh, we tell those who run the breast milk bank not to depend on the milk bank or to get the mother and the baby together to breastfeed rather yeah. than dependent on the milk bank. It is only in dire last situation to bank on the milk bank. Okay. 
Thanks a lot, Kumuda. The, the question actually explains that the situation in the hospital is not good. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that only one out of two mothers are able to begin breastfeeding yeah. within an hour of birth. Whatever is the situation, let's not just only think about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next is, can homeopaths help in monitoring the IMS Act? Yes. And uh, there's a question, how? So how is... Uh, yeah, uh, you can get in touch with BPNI team. Uh, it's, it's a question from Simran. Then, uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, how can Ayush people get trained in IMS Act? Again, the question asked by Simran. Uh, yes, certainly, Ayush people, whosoever. It's, you don't need to be a doctor or a health worker to monitor IMS Act. So we can certainly, you get in touch with BPNI, uh, right away. Yeah, we can certainly make it happen. Uh, yeah, second. Uh, Arunji, you mute, okay? There is no law that you need a consent at the moment, but it would be better. So the next is uh, important, uh, very good. Uh, request to UNICEF to have a partnership in Chhattisgarh and uh, people are thanking. Thanks a lot uh, for all the questions. I hope we have been able to answer them in case or uh, answer your comments also. But in case we have missed something, we apologize right now and we will ensure that these are answered when we get the whole questions into our, uh, uh, after we finish it, we will get the whole set of questions and the chat uh, and we will analyze and study. If you have not answered, we will get back to you. But those who really want to reach BPNI, I again repeat, BPNI's email is bpni at bpni.org. So you can reach there. And uh, I will now hand over to Professor Kushwaha, who is the chief coordinator of BPNI and has been leading the training. He's a pioneer in development and passing on the skills of training together so to sum up and uh, give his close, closing remarks. Thank you very much uh, everyone for, for being with us and this is the last session. Yeah. Arunji, sorry, sorry to break in. I just want to, uh, with apologies to all my fellow panelists and everybody, the organizers, I have to leave now. So no. I just wanted to say bye. Thank you so much. Okay. I learned a lot from uh, yeah everything and okay, Bandana, nice and to be with you. With all of you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Arun. Uh, you see, uh, we are talking about IMS Act, which is very strong, but this strong act was so tender during this COVID period. I have been practicing for uh, throughout the COVID period, except one or two months. And now I am observing every mother is coming with a in a formula, not one or two, every mother during this pandemic. So that means that monitoring of the act, whatever is it is strength, if monitoring is weak, if implementation is weak, and if execution is weak, the act will be regularly violated by people. So who is responsible? Government, no doubt, on the top, because it has to uh, initiate legal action through its agencies. As uh, Arun was very clear, it is a criminal act, and anyone, any police uh, officer can register a case if it is being violated or his, his case is brought to the notice. Now, uh, the Food Safety Act uh, officer, uh, the drug inspectors, all can register a case, but it is not being done. Then other responsible bodies are industries and uh, professional bodies. Uh, professional bodies, except IAP, IAP is very strong in this context now. Other uh, professional bodies, they need to make a strong commitment that they will ensure that act is not being violated. The responsibility lies to health workers, institutions, health facilities, 
and uh, as bandana uh, was very clear many of the top institutions in the country they are not knowing about that and they are financing those works which are supported by industry so these all uh, the people they are responsible bfhi is one which government can implement and this should be made made a essential criteria for registration of hospitals facilities must have a bfhi facility and this requirement because we have requirement for pollution of fire fighting and so many other things not of how we can save babies so it should be made one of the standard of practice that anyone uh, we are talking about what legal action can be taken uh, it should be through police it should be through criminal system through government system notifying agencies uh, you see the government has uh, put notifying agencies name in act but it's not written that what should be the modus of operandi of those uh, notifying agencies how they are going to register a case and if they are going to register a case who is going to fight the case we have been uh, not having good experience at pni after going to the court and registering a case the action can be ethical through the institutions uh, like uh, the nursing council like medical council uh, like uh, other councils we have it should be through programs government can make a program it could be through information and training so i think that lot of actions can be done and uh, this uh, first workshop uh, in the national workshop for for breastfeeding week has been very important in this way that this has brought to all these points in notice and i think that now we have to think how can it it into action so thank you all for being here thank you uh, ma'am santa uh, for being with us dr pius who left us early but he is no doubt very important person uh, to monitor and implement the, this act and all those in the panel Uh, list uh, dr gayatri dr kumda dr dinesh and vandana uh, 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 prashad all of you really uh, thanks from the core of heart and uh, i think that let us keep ourselves united and let us support bpni also bpni has become a, a very you see uh, at a very uh, tender point now and we all need some support uh, we need to support bp and i at this point thank you arun thank you everyone thank you so much thanks a lot uh, dr kushwaha and everyone again i would like to express my sincere thanks and regards to you all for uh, being the panelists and preparing and speaking today and all the participants for sparing their time to be with us and listen asking so many wonderful questions as well as suggestions and comments in the chat which we will like to take it forward many many thanks again okay. thank you bye bye bye, bye. bye everyone thank you thank you bye thank you thank you, thank you everyone bye thank you. bye, bye.